Hi, my name is Cristina Poggi. I've been a breast radiographer for 20 years. I've been dealing with training and education in mammography for 11 years. In the next two lessons, I'll be talking about a very important topic in mammography, the compression. Describing it in several ways, trying to sum up the physics, anatomical, chemical and emphatic principle of the process. It is widely accepted that applying an adequate compression of the breast is needed in mammography. It is an important skill for the radiographer to acquire to ensure acceptable image quality, which is a prerequisite for detection of mammary lesion and thus of the breast screening program success. More exactly, the uh, biomedical image quality is made of two parts, the technical one and the clinical one. The both of them have to be high because all in this way the radiologist could appreciate those radiological aspects of a lesion that allow him, her, to make a diagnosis. Regarding technical quality, we know the mammography image produced must have a very high spatial and contrast resolution with an acceptable delivered dose. We should be able to effectively document microcalcification of 100 micron average dimension by very small then, but characterized by high contrast, to properly assess the lesion morphology, especially its margins, and also to assess very low contrast breast tissue portions to highlight parenchyma thickenings and eventual architectural distortion. The breast is an organ made by relatively radiolucent soft tissues with very similar density and atomic numbers. I mean that the linear attenuation coefficient, that is to say the capacity to attenuate the radiant beam, removing a fraction of photons from it, are similar. The contrast between earthy and pathological tissue is very low. It must be increased by minimizing scattering. This is the reason why in mammography low energy beams are used. Scattering increases with the increasing of the agent energy beam. And by applying a compression of the burst in order to obtain a reduction of its thickness. Contrast is affected by the so-called SPR, scatter to primary ratio, which is the ratio between scattering energy S and that of the primary beam P. In fact, the contrast C improves with increasing the primary beam energy and decreasing the breast thickness and decreasing the scattering. Small focal spots and the low tube voltage impose an increase in exposure time. Compression allows to immobilize the breast and thus decrease the blurring risk. The thickness reduction decreases also the dose required to produce a high quality image. Compression in mammography improves all technical quality parameters. It reduces anatomical noise given by structure's superimposition, called also summation artifact or masking artifact, better depicting structures that are at different depths in the breast, separating them from each other, very useful especially in dense breasts. It allows a reduction of the dose required, as we said, it provides a uniform thickness so the radiologist can say if a variation of density is a lesion and not a variation of thickness. It decreases kinetic blurring and geometric penumbra, better depicting structures that are far from the detector. Both these phenomena can obscure a lesion or make it not easy to characterize, thus demanding retakes, thereby increasing the dose uh, delivered to the patient and raising her anxiety. The thickness reduction also allows a more homogeneous exposure of the breast, that is a very heterogeneous organ in structure and shape, and a better dynamic range.
This is a typical example of summation artifact in which a localized increase in breast tissue density is created due to an inadequate compression force applied, but also due to a not correct acquisition geometry. Some other examples of uh, a spatial resolution decrease due to an inadequate compression in the uh, ratio areola zone and in the deep outer quadrant. This is a dense breast. You can see how much an inadequate compression could degradate the image quality. Sometimes, though, the blurring is present, but in a micro zone, scarcely visible, and sometimes an artifact like that uh, is due to not proper stretching and smoothing out tissue more than compression. By saying dynamic range, I mean the number of rays made available to whom reports in mammography, and it it is so much wiser in digital radiography than in the analogical one. I said a very high contrast resolution is needed in mammography, but I also have to point out the importance of noise, that is, the maximum deterrent quality in every biomedical digital image. Rather than contrast, we should talk then about contrast to noise ratio. CNR. It expresses the ability to detect very small changes in the grayscale, distinguishing them from noise. Given that, signal to noise ratio is equal to C contrast, square root of A area of the object, and Q photons number per area, we can understand why improving contrast means improving signal-to-noise ratio, which is in fact the more significant parameter to measure the ability to detect an object, called conspicuity. The breast components are fibroglandular tissue and fat. By a chemical point of view, more than 60% uh, percent is water, which corresponds to fibroglandular tissue, with about 33% of proteins that are in the skin reinforced with strong connecti connective tissue fibers. There is not much talk about skin in mammography. Instead, it is important for positioning and for compression too as we will see later. The components which contribute to the contrast are actually three, water, fat and calcium. The contrast to noise ratio varies depending on several aspects, also on the breast volume. It is better in small breasts. The breast tissues have different mechanical properties and therefore they have a different response to the force exerted by the puzzle, which in turn varies locally because of the breast shape. If the breast were homogeneous in structure, compression would simply vary with the size of it. The effect of the force that applies is determined by tissue viscoelasticity, which differ from one woman and the other. And this is why breasts have a compressibility, or if you like, a compliance, of their own, each of them. Compressibility depends on many aspects. In my method of teaching, I consider these three basic parameters. The outline of breast base on the chest wall, the footprint, the breast volume, and the skin envelope. They were proposed in the plastic surgery field by an internationally known surgeon, Philip Blondil. From those parameters I could deduce the breast compressibility and hence I could categorize patients in three groups. I call the groups A, B, C simply, and for each of them is provided a different specific range of compression, as we will see in the next lesson, as well as a specific positioning approach on the basis of the most common mistakes for each group, highlighted by the research project still underway called CATER. One of the main objectives is to simplify standardization also in compression, which is a very desirable process, but still far from being achieved. 
group A presents a very wide footprint in superior inferior direction and in medial lhasa 2. A generally a small volume, the consistency is high, is almost hard to detach. This is to say, is, it is not manipulatable, not mobile, zero ptosis. Not easy to be compressed too, mainly for CC projection. The skin could have a strong impact on the compression forced to be used in this group. The breasts in group B have ratio between the breast base on the chest wall and the volume, in anterior-posterior direction especially, which tend to 1, or from 1 to 2, a medium to large volume with the medium consistency and mobility. It is easy enough to be pulled away from the thorax and stretched out and compressed. There is no such a thing like an easy breast to document on a mammogram, but the higher percentage of optimum exams belongs usually to this group. In the group C, the breast base on the chest wall is medium or even small when compared to at the anterior posterior dimension of the volume. Low consistency, they are a soft breast, very manipulatable, and usually sagging too. The problem here is related to the distribution on the compression force, uh, which is not uniform throughout the area. In group C patients, the axillary tails and the um, uxothoracic tissue can be very thick. Those portions absorb most of the force applied, thus preventing an adequate compression of the anterior part of the breast, where we would like to always have it because most of the gland is found there. This can lead to the fall of the breast during the acquisition time or to an increase in exposure time such as to produce blurred mammograms or mammograms where the breast is not properly held out. It is not only due to an inadequate compression, but also to the difficulty in lifting very heavy and ptosic breasts. IMF and posterior inferior quadrant are lost. It's also easier to make a rotating mistake. You see, the nipple is not in profile here. You can produce very good exams, of course, but Skin folds are typically seen on them, not easily resolvable, induced by the laxity of the skin envelope. Other two examples of uh, inadequate compression. Also in MLO projection, the blurring could be uh, very uh, localized to the axillary tail, or more typically, to posterior inferior quadrant. Low compression is usually associated to not proper positioning in this projection. The real effects uh, of compression forced on the detectability of breast pathological conditions have never been actually investigated in large in vivo research projects, I mean to my knowledge. Compression has, however, been correlated to the detection rate, which is the number of cancers detected uh, divided by the total number of screen mammograms and to PPV the positive predictive value, defined as the percentage of abnormal mammography results that had a subsequent cancer diagnosis. We do know that the image quality is degraded if too low a force is applied, with a decrease in specificity. It has to be a minimum value below which the quality of the image is compromised, and it should be based on scientific evidence. Furthermore, there are many researchers who suggest that too high a compression force may reduce sensitivity. It is reasoned that softer tumors may become less conspicuous, tissue, pathological tissue may spread out so that the contrast to healthy tissue drops. Other studies would show that anyway after center value a further level of compression force 
does not improve the overall image quality. It has to be then also a maximum value of the compression force to apply. However, there are not recommended compression values in European guidelines. Apart from a purely qualitative description, it is even emphasized that the optimal value of force to be applied does not exist or, at least, is not known. In the technical part of the guidelines, we read a range from 130 to 200 Newton. In the examples you could see here, taken from some national guidelines, a recommended range does exist, uh, surprisingly similar to each other, although actually very wide. In fact, despite official recommendations, studies on the subject have shown that there is a highly significant difference in the mean compression used by breast radiographers. For example, by entering the data found in this article published in 2017, I was able to build this column chart on the compression habits in many countries of the world. Low compression in light blue, intermediate in green, and high compression in red. As you can see, we Italians, together with Dutch and Malaysian uh, colleagues choose high compression values more frequently than radiographers from other countries. Well, uh, these are some papers I found interesting on the matter. There are still many aspects to discuss, the compression unit of measurement, the difference between pressure and compression, the phases into which the compression process in mammography can be divided, the pain and the global discomfort felt by the patient, what factors are important for the radiographer to decide which compression to apply. Well, it's uh, all for now. Hope you have enjoyed. Thanks for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you at the next lesson in about a week. Bye-bye. Um,